The Picture of Dorian Gray Chapter 1 The studio was filled with the rich odour of roses, and when the light summer wind stirred amidst the trees of the garden, there came through the open door the heavy scent of the lilac, or the more delicate perfume of the pink flowering thorn. From the corner of the divan of Persian saddlebags, on which he was lying, smoking, as was his custom, innumerable cigarettes, Lord Henry Watson could just catch the gleam of the honey-sweet and honey-coloured blossoms of a laburnum, whose tremulous branches seemed hardly able to bear the burden of a beauty so flame-like as theirs and now, and then the fantastic shadows of birds in flight flitted across the long tuss or silk curtains that were stretched in front of the huge window, producing a kind of momentary Japanese effect, and making him think of those pallid, jade-faced painters of Tokyo who, through the medium of an art that is necessarily immobile, seek to convey the sense of swiftness and motion. The sullen murmur of the bees shouldering their way through the long and mown grass, or circling with monotonous insistence round the dusty gilt horns of the straggling woodbine, seemed to make the stillness more oppressive. The dim roar of London was like the borden note of a distant organ. In the centre of the room, clamped to an upright easel, stood the full-length portrait of a young man of extraordinary personal beauty, and in front of it, some little distance away, was sitting the artist himself, Basil Hallward, whose sudden disappearance some years ago caused, at the time, such public excitement and gave rise to so many strange conjectures. As the painter looked at the gracious and comely form he had so skilfully mirrored in his art, a smile of pleasure passed across his face and seemed about to linger there, but he suddenly started up, and closing his eyes, placed his fingers upon the lids, as though he sought to imprison within his brain some curious dream from which he feared he might awake. It is your best work, Basil, the best thing you have ever done, said Lord Henry languidly. You must certainly send it next year to the Grosvenor. The academy is too large and too vulgar. Whenever I have gone there, there have been either so many people that I have not been able to see the pictures, which was dreadful, or so many pictures that I have not been able to see the people, which was worse. The Grosvenor is really the only place. I don't think I shall send it anywhere, he answered, tossing his head back in that odd way that used to make his friends laugh at him at Oxford. No, I won't send it anywhere. Lord Henry elevated his eyebrows and looked at him in amazement through the thin blue wreaths of smoke that curled up in such fanciful whirls from his heavy, opium-tainted cigarette. Not send it anywhere, my dear fellow. Why, have you any reason? What odd chaps you painters are. You do anything in the world to gain a reputation. As soon as you have one, you seem to want to throw it away. It is silly of you, for there is only one thing in the world worse than being talked about, and that is not being talked about. A portrait like this would set you far above all the young men in England, and make the old men quite jealous, if old men are ever capable of any emotion. I know you will laugh at me, he replied, but I really can't exhibit it. I have put too much of myself into it. Lord Henry stretched himself out on the divan and laughed. Yes, I knew you would, but it is quite true, all the same. Too much of yourself in it. Upon my word, Basil, I didn't know you were so vain, and I really can't see any resemblance between you, with your rugged strong face, and your coal-black hair, and this young Adonis, who looks as if he was made out of ivory and rose leaves. Why, my dear Basil, he's a narcissist, and you, well, of course you have an intellectual expression and all that, but beauty, real beauty, ends where an intellectual expression begins. Intellect is in itself a mode of exaggeration and destroys the harmony of any face. The moment one sits down to think, one becomes all nose or all forehead or something horrid. Look at the successful men in any of the learned professions. How perfectly hideous they are, except of course, in the church. But then in the church they don't think. A bishop keeps on saying at the age of eighty what he was told to say when he was a boy of eighteen. And as a natural consequence, 
he always looks absolutely delightful. Your mysterious young friend, whose name you have never told me, but whose picture really fascinates me, never thinks. I feel quite sure of that. He's some brainless beautiful creature who should be always here in winter when we have no flowers to look at, and always here in summer when we want something to chill our intelligence. Don't flatter yourself, Basil, you are not in the least like him. You don't understand me, Harry, answered the artist. Of course I am not like him. I know that perfectly well. Indeed, I should be sorry to look like him. You shrug your shoulders. I am telling you the truth. There is a fatality about all physical and intellectual distinction, the sort of fatality that seems to dog through history the faltering steps of kings. It is better not to be different from one's fellows. The ugly and the stupid have the best of it in this world. They can sit at their ease and gape at the play. If they know nothing of victory, they are at least spared the knowledge of defeat. They live as we all should live, undisturbed, indifferent, and without disquiet. They neither bring ruin upon others, nor ever receive it from alien hands. Your rank and wealth, harry my brains, such as they are, my art, whatever it may be worth Dorian Gray's good looks, we shall all suffer for what the gods have given us, suffer terribly. Dorian Gray, is that his name? Asked Lord Henry, walking across the studio towards Basil Hallward. Yes, that is his name. I didn't intend to tell it to you, but why not? Oh, I can't explain. When I like people immensely, I never tell their names to anyone. It is like surrendering a part of them. I have grown to love secrecy. It seems to be the one thing that can make modern life mysterious or marvellous to us. The commonest thing is delightful if one only hides it. When I leave town now I never tell my people where I am going. If I did, I would lose all my pleasure. It is a silly habit, I dare say, but somehow it seems to bring a great deal of romance into one's life. I suppose you think me awfully foolish about it. Not at all, answered Lord Henry. Not at all, my dear Basil. You seem to forget that I am married, and the one charm of marriage is that it makes a life of deception absolutely necessary for both parties. I never know where my wife is, and my wife never knows what I am doing. When we meet, we do meet occasionally. When we dine out together, or go down to the Dukes to we tell each other the most absurd stories with the most serious faces. My wife is very good at it, much better, in fact, than I am. She never gets confused over her dates, and I always do. But when she does find me out, she makes no row at all. I sometimes wish she would, but she merely laughs at me. I hate the way you talk about your married life, Harry, said Basil Hallward strolling towards the door that led into the garden. I believe that you are really a very good husband, but that you are thoroughly ashamed of your own virtues. You are an extraordinary fellow. You never say a moral thing, and you never do a wrong thing. Your cynicism is simply a pose. Being natural is simply a pose, and the most irritating pose I know, cried Lord Henry, laughing and the two young men went out into the garden together and ensconced themselves on a long bamboo seat that stood in the shade of a tall laurel bush. The sunlight slipped over the polished leaves. In the grass, white daisies were tremulous. After a pause, Lord Henry pulled out his watch. I am afraid I must be going, Basil, he murmured, and before I go, I insist on your answering a question I put to you some time ago. What is that? said the painter, keeping his eyes fixed on the ground. You know quite well. I do not, Harry. Well, I will tell you what it is. I want you to explain to me why you won't exhibit Dorian Gray's picture. I want the real reason. I told you the real reason. No, you did not. You said it was because there was too much of yourself in it. Now, that is childish. Harry, said Basil Hallward, looking him straight in the face, every portrait that is painted with feeling is a portrait of the artist, not of the sitter. The sitter is merely the accident, the occasion. It is not he who is revealed by the painter, it is rather the painter who, on the coloured canvas, reveals himself. 
The reason I will not exhibit this picture is that I am afraid that I have shown in it the secret of my own soul. Lord Henry laughed. And what is that? He asked. I will tell you, said Hallward, but an expression of perplexity came over his face. I am all expectation. Basil, continued his companion, glancing at him. Oh, there is really very little to tell. Harry, answered the painter, and I am afraid you will hardly understand it. Perhaps you will hardly believe it. Lord Henry smiled, and leaning down, plucked a pink-petaled daisy from Le Grasse and examined it. I am quite sure I shall understand it, he replied, gazing intently at the little golden, white-feathered disc, and as for believing things, I can believe anything, provided that it is quite incredible. The wind shook some blossoms from the trees, and the heavy lilac blooms, with their clustering stars, moved to and fro in the languid air. A grasshopper began to cheer up by the wall, and like a blue thread, a long thin dragonfly floated past on its brown gauze wings. Lord Henry felt as if he could hear Basil Hallward's heart beating, and wondered what was coming. The story is simply this, said the painter after some time. Two months ago I went to a crush at Lady Brandon's. You know we poor artists have to show ourselves in society from time to time, just to remind the public that we are not savages. With an evening coat and a white tie, as you told me once, anybody, even a stockbroker, can gain a reputation for being civilised. Well, after I had been in the room about ten minutes, talking to huge overdressed dowagers and tedious academicians, I suddenly became conscious that someone was looking at me. I turned halfway round and saw Dorian Gray for the first time. When our eyes met, I felt that I was growing pale. A curious sensation of terror came over me. I knew that I had come face to face with someone whose mere personality was so fascinating that, if I allowed it to do so, it would absorb my whole nature, my whole soul, my very art itself. I did not want any external influence in my life. You know yourself, Harry, how independent I am by nature. I have always been my own master, had at least always been so, till I met Dorian Gray. Then, but I don't know how to explain it to you, something seemed to tell me that I was on the verge of a terrible crisis in my life. I had a strange feeling that fate had in store for me exquisite joys and exquisite sorrows. I grew afraid and turned to quit the room. It was not conscience that made me do so. It was a sort of cowardice. I take no credit to myself for trying to escape. Conscience and cowardice are really the same things, Basil. Conscience is the trade name of the firm. That is all. I don't believe that, Harry, and I don't believe you do either. However, whatever was my motive, and it may have been pride, for I used to be very proud, I certainly struggled to the door. There, of course, I stumbled against Lady Brandon. You are not going to run away so soon, Mr. Holwood. She screamed out. You know her curiously shrill voice. Yes, she's a peacock in everything but beauty, said Lord Henry, pulling the daisy to bits with his long nervous fingers. I could not get rid of her. She brought me up to royalties, and people with stars and garters, and elderly ladies with gigantic tiaras and parrot noses. She spoke of me as her dearest friend. I had only met her once before, but she took it into her head to lionise me. I believe some picture of mine had made a great success at the time, at least had been chattered about in the penny newspapers, which is the 19th century standard of immortality. Suddenly I found myself face to face with the young man whose personality had so strangely stirred me. We were quite close, almost touching. Our eyes met again. It was reckless of me, but I asked Lady Brandon to introduce me to him. Perhaps it was not so reckless, after all. It was simply inevitable. We would have spoken to each other without any introduction. I am sure of that. Dorian told me so afterwards. He, too, felt that we were destined to know each other. And how did Lady Brandon describe this wonderful young man? Asked his companion. I know she goes in for giving a rapid précis of all her guests. I remember her bringing me up to a truculent and red-faced old gentleman 
covered all over with orders and ribbons, and hissing into my ear, in a tragic whisper, which must have been perfectly audible to everybody in the room, the most astounding details. I simply fled. I like to find out people for myself, but Lady Brandon treats her guests exactly as an auctioneer treats his goods. She either explains them entirely away, or tells one everything about them except what one wants to know. Poor Lady Brandon, you are hard on her, Harry, said Holwood listlessly. My dear fellow, she tried to found a salon, and only succeeded in opening a restaurant. How could I admire her? But tell me, what did she say about Mr. Dorian Gray? Oh, something like, charming boy, poor dear mother, and I absolutely inseparable. Quite forget what he does, afraid he, doesn't do anything. Oh, yes, plays the piano or is it the violin, dear M.R. Gray. Neither of us could help laughing, and we became friends at once. Laughter is not at all a bad beginning for a friendship, and it is far the best ending for one, said the young lord, plucking another daisy. Holwood shook his head. You don't understand what friendship is, Harry, he murmured, or what enmity is, for that matter. You like everyone, that is to say. You are indifferent to everyone. How horribly unjust of you, cried Lord Henry, tilting his hat back and looking up at the little clouds that, like raveled skeins of glossy white silk, were drifting across the hollowed turquoise of the summer sky. Yes, horribly unjust of you. I make a great difference between people. One choose my friends for their good looks, my acquaintances for their good characters, and my enemies for their good intellects. A man cannot be too careful in the choice of his enemies. I have not got one who is a fool. They are all men of some intellectual power, and consequently they all appreciate me. Is that very vain of me? I think it is rather vain. I should think it was, Harry. But according to your category I must be merely an acquaintance. My dear old Basil, you are much more than an acquaintance, and much less than a friend. A sort of brother, I suppose. Oh, brothers, I don't care for brothers. My elder brother won't die, and my younger brothers seem never to do anything else. Harry, exclaimed Hallward, frowning. My dear fellow, I am not quite serious, but I can't help detesting my relations. I suppose it comes from the fact that none of us can stand other people having the same faults as ourselves. I quite sympathise with the rage of the English democracy against what they call the vices of the upper orders. The masses feel that drunkenness, stupidity and immorality should be their own special property, and that if any one of us makes an ass of himself, he's poaching on their preserves. When poor Southwark got into the divorce court, their indignation was quite magnificent. And yet, I don't suppose that 10% of the proletariat live correctly. I don't agree with a single word that you have said. And, what is more, Harry, I feel sure you don't either. Lord Henry stroked his pointed brown beard and tapped the toe of his patent leather boot with a tasseled ebony cane. How English you are, Basil. That is the second time you have made that observation. If one puts forward an idea to a true Englishman, always a rash thing to do. He never dreams of considering whether the idea is right or wrong. The only thing he considers of any importance is whether one believes it oneself. Now, the value of an idea has nothing whatsoever to do with the sincerity of the man who expresses it. Indeed, the probabilities are that the more insincere the man is, the more purely intellectual will the idea be, as in that case, it will not be coloured by either his wants, his desires, or his prejudices. However, I don't propose to discuss politics, sociology, or metaphysics with you. I like persons better than principles, and I like persons with no principles better than anything else in the world. Tell me more about Mr. Dorian Gray. How often do you see him? Every day. I couldn't be happy if I didn't see him every day. He's absolutely necessary to me. How extraordinary. I thought you would never care for anything but your art. He's all my art to me now, said the painter gravely. I sometimes think, Harry, that there are only two eras of any importance in the world's history, 
The first is the appearance of a new medium for art, and the second is the appearance of a new personality for art also. What the invention of oil painting was to the Venetians, the face of Antinous was to late Greek sculpture, and the face of Dorian Gray will some day be to me. It is not merely that I paint from him, draw from him, sketch from him. Of course, I have done all that, but he is much more to me than a model or a sitter. I won't tell you that I am dissatisfied with what I have done of him, or that his beauty is such that art cannot express it. There is nothing that art cannot express, and I know that the work I have done, since I met Dorian Gray, is good work, is the best work of my life. But in some curious way, I wonder will you understand me? His personality has suggested to me an entirely new manner in art, an entirely new mode of style. I see things differently, I think of them differently. I can now recreate life in a way that was hidden from me before. A dream of form in days of thought. Who is it who says that? I forget, but it is what Dorian Gray has been to me. The merely visible presence of this lad, for he seems to me little more than a lad, though he is really over twenty. His merely visible presence. Ah, I wonder can you realise all that that means? Unconsciously, he defines for me the lines of a fresh school a school that is to have in it all the passion of the romantic spirit, all the perfection of the spirit that is Greek, the harmony of soul and body, how much that is. We in our madness have separated the two and have invented a realism that is vulgar, an ideality that is void. Harry, if you only knew what Dorian Gray is to me, you remember that landscape of mine for which Agno offered me such a huge price but which I would not part with. It is one of the best things I have ever done. And why is it so? Because, while I was painting it, Dorian Gray sat beside me. Some subtle influence passed from him to me. And for the first time in my life I saw in the plain woodland the wonder I had always looked for and always missed. Basil, this is extraordinary. I must see Dorian Gray. Hallwood got up from the seat and walked up and down the garden. After some time he came back. Harry, he said, Dorian Gray is to me simply a motive in art. You might see nothing in him. I see everything in him. He is never more present in my work than when no image of him is there. He is a suggestion, as I have said, of a new manner. I find him in the curves of certain lines, in the loveliness and subtleties of certain colours. That is all. Then why won't you exhibit his portrait? Ask Lord Henry because, without intending it, I have put into it some expression of all this curious artistic idolatry, of which, of course, I have never cared to speak to him. He knows nothing about it. He shall never know anything about it, but the world might guess it, and I will not bear my soul to their shallow prying eyes. My heart shall never be put under their microscope. There is too much of myself in the thing. Harry, too much of myself. Poets are not so scrupulous as you are. They know how useful passion is for publication. Nowadays a broken heart will run to many editions. I hate them for it, cried Hallwood. An artist should create beautiful things, but should put nothing of his own life into them. We live in an age when men treat art as if it were meant to be a form of autobiography. We have lost the abstract sense of beauty. Some day will show the world what it is, and for that reason the world shall never see my portrait of Dorian Gray. I think you are wrong, Basil, but I won't argue with you. It is only the intellectually lost who ever argue. Tell me, is Dorian Gray very fond of you? The painter considered for a few moments. He likes me, he answered after a pause. I know he likes me. Of course I flatter him dreadfully. I find a strange pleasure in saying things to him that I know I shall be sorry for having said. As a rule, he's charming to me, and we sit in the studio and talk of a thousand things. Now and then, however, he is horribly thoughtless and seems to take a real delight in giving me pain. Then I feel, Harry, that I have given away my whole soul to someone who treats it as if it were a flower to put in his coat a bit of decoration to charm his vanity, 
an ornament for a summer's day. Days in summer, Basil, are apt to linger, murmured Lord Henry. Perhaps you will tire sooner than he will. It is a sad thing to think of, but there is no doubt that genius lasts longer than beauty. That accounts for the fact that we all take such pains to over-educate ourselves. In the world struggle for existence, we want to have something that endures, and so we fill our minds with rubbish and facts, in the silly hope of keeping our place. The thoroughly well-informed man, that is the modern ideal, and the mind of the thoroughly well-informed man is a dreadful thing. It is like a bric-a-brac shop, all monsters and dust, with everything priced above its proper value. I think you will tire first, all the same. Some day you will look at your friend, and he will seem to you to be a little out of drawing, or you won't like his tone of colour, or something. You will bitterly reproach him in your own heart, and seriously think that he has behaved very badly to you. The next time he calls, you will be perfectly cold and indifferent. It will be a great pity, for it will alter you. What you have told me is quite a romance. A romance of art, one might call it. And the worst of having a romance of any kind is that it leaves one so unromantic. Harry, don't talk like that. As long as I live, the personality of Dorian Gray will dominate me. You can't feel what I feel. You change too often. Ah, my dear Basil, that is exactly why I can feel it. Those who are faithful know only the trivial side of love. It is the faithless who know love's tragedies. And Lord Henry struck a light on a dainty silver case and began to smoke a cigarette with a self-conscious and satisfied air, as if he had summed up the world in a phrase. There was a rustle of chirruping sparrows in the green lacquer leaves of the ivy and the blue cloud shadows chased themselves across the grass like swallows. How pleasant it was in the garden, and how delightful other people's emotions were, much more delightful than their ideas, it seemed to him, one's own soul, and the passions of one's friends, those were the fascinating things in life. He pictured to himself, with silent amusement, the tedious luncheon that he had missed by staying so long with Basil Hallward. Had he gone to his aunt's, he would have been sure to have met Lord Goodbody there, and the whole conversation would have been about the feeding of the poor and the necessity for model lodging houses. Each class would have preached the importance of those virtues, for whose exercise there was no necessity in their own lives. The rich would have spoken on the value of thrift, and the idle grown eloquent over the dignity of labour. It was charming to have escaped all that. As he thought of his aunt, an idea seemed to strike him. He turned to Hallward and said, My dear fellow, I have just remembered. Remembered what? Harry, where I heard the name of Dorian Gray. Where was it? Asked Hallward with a slight frown. Don't look so angry, Basil. It was at my aunt, Lady Agatha's. She told me she had discovered a wonderful young man who was going to help her in the East End and that his name was Dorian Gray. I am bound to state that she never told me he was good-looking. Women have no appreciation of good looks at least. Good women have not. She said that he was very earnest and had a beautiful nature. I at once pictured to myself a creature with spectacles and lank hair, horribly freckled, and tramping about on huge feet. I wish I had known it was your friend. I am very glad you didn't. Harry. Why? I don't want you to meet him. You don't want me to meet him. No, Mr. Dorian Gray is in the studio, sir, said the butler, coming into the garden. You must introduce me now, cried Lord Henry, laughing. The painter turned to his servant, who stood blinking in the sunlight. Ask Mr. Gray to wait, Parker. I shall be in in a few moments. The man bowed and went up the walk. Then he looked at Lord Henry. Dorian Gray is my dearest friend, he said. He has a simple and a beautiful nature. Your aunt was quite right in what she said of him. Don't spoil him. Don't try to influence him. Your influence would be bad. The world is wide and has many marvellous people in it. Don't take away from me the one person who gives to my art whatever charm it possesses. My life as an artist depends on him. Mind, Harry, I trust you. He spoke very slowly, 
and the words seemed wrung out of him almost against his will. What nonsense you talk, said Lord Henry, smiling, and taking Hallward by the arm. He almost led him into the house. Chapter 2 As they entered, they saw Dorian Gray. He was seated at the piano, with his back to them, turning over the pages of a volume of Schumann's Forest Scenes. You must lend me these, Basil, he cried. I want to learn them. They are perfectly charming. That entirely depends on how you sit today, Dorian. Oh, I am tired of sitting, and I don't want a life-sized portrait of myself, answered the lad, swinging round on the music stall in a willful, petulant manner. When he caught sight of Lord Henry, a faint blush coloured his cheeks for a moment, and he started up. I beg your pardon, Basil, but I didn't know you had anyone with you. This is Lord Henry Wotton, Dorian, an old Oxford friend of mine. I have just been telling him what a capital city you were, and now you have spoiled everything. You have not spoiled my pleasure in meeting you, Mr. Gray, said Lord Henry, stepping forward and extending his hand. My aunt has often spoken to me about you. You are one of her favourites, and, I am afraid, one of her victims also. I am in Lady Agatha's black books at present, answered Dorian with a funny look of penitence. I promised to go to a club in Whitechapel with her last Tuesday, and I really forgot all about it. We were to have played a duet together, three duets, I believe. I don't know what she will say to me. I am far too frightened to call. Oh, I will make your peace with my aunt. She's quite devoted to you, and I don't think it really matters about your not being there. The audience probably thought it was a duet. When Aunt Agatha sits down to the piano, she makes quite enough noise for two people. That is very horrid to her, and not very nice to me, answered Dorian, laughing. Lord Henry looked at him. Yes, he was certainly wonderfully handsome, with his finely curved scarlet lips, his frank blue eyes, his crisp gold hair. There was something in his face that made one trust him at once. All the candour of youth was there, as well as all youth's passionate purity. One felt that he had kept himself unspotted from the world. No wonder Basil Hallwood worshipped him. You are too charming to go in for philanthropy, Mr. Gray. Far too charming. And Lord Henry flung himself down on the divan and opened his cigarette case. The painter had been busy mixing his colours and getting his brushes ready. He was looking worried and when he heard Lord Henry's last remark, he glanced at him, hesitated for a moment, and then said, Harry, I want to finish this picture today. Would you think it awfully rude of me if I asked you to go away? Lord Henry smiled and looked at Dorian Gray. Am I to go, Mr. Gray? He asked, Oh, please don't, Lord Henry. I see that Basil is in one of his sulky moods and I can't bear him when he sulks. Besides, I want you to tell me why I should not go in for philanthropy. I don't know that I shall tell you that, Mr. Gray. It is so tedious a subject that one would have to talk seriously about it, but I certainly shall not run away, now that you have asked me to stop. You don't really mind, Basil, do you? You have often told me that you liked your sitters to have someone to chat to. Holwood bit his lip. If Dorian wishes it, of course you must stay. Dorian's whims are laws to everybody, except himself. Lord Henry took up his hat and gloves. You are very pressing, Basil, but I am afraid I must go. I have promised to meet a man at the Orleans. Goodbye, Mr. Gray. Come and see me some afternoon in Curzon Street. I am nearly always at home at five o'clock. Write to me when you are coming. I should be sorry to miss you. Basil, cried Dorian Gray, if Lord Henry Wotton goes, I shall go, too. You never open your lips while you are painting, and it is horribly dull standing on a platform and trying to look pleasant. Ask him to stay. I insist upon it. Stay, Harry, to oblige Dorian, and to oblige me, said Hallward, gazing intently at his picture. It is quite true. I never talk when I am working and never listen either, and it must be dreadfully tedious for my unfortunate sitters. I beg you to stay. 
but what about my man at the Orleans? The painter laughed. I don't think there will be any difficulty about that. Sit down again, Harry. And now, Dorian, get up on the platform, and don't move about too much, or pay any attention to what Lord Henry says. He has a very bad influence over all his friends, with the single exception of myself. Dorian Gray stepped up on the dais with the air of a young Greek martyr, and made a little moue of discontent to Lord Henry, to whom he had rather taken a fancy. He was so unlike Basil. They made a delightful contrast, and he had such a beautiful voice. After a few moments he said to him, Have you really a very bad influence, Lord Henry? As bad as Basil says, there is no such thing as a good influence, Mr. Gray. All influence is immoral. Immoral from the scientific point of view. Why? Because to influence a person is to give him one's own soul. He does not think his natural thoughts or burn with his natural passions. His virtues are not real to him. His sins, if there are such things as sins, are borrowed. He becomes an echo of someone else's music, an actor of a part that has not been written for him. Yes, continued Lord Henry, that is one of the great secrets of life, uh, to cure the soul by means of the senses, and the senses by means of the soul. You are a wonderful creation. You know more than you think you know, just as you know less than you want to know. Dorian Gray frowned and turned his head away. He could not help liking the tall, graceful young man who was standing by him. His romantic, olive-coloured face and worn expression interested him. There was something in his low languid voice that was absolutely fascinating. His cool, white, flower-like hands, even, had a curious charm. They moved, as he spoke, like music, and seemed to have a language of their own. But he felt afraid of him and ashamed of being afraid. Why had it been left for a stranger to reveal him to himself? He had known Basil Hallwood four months, but the friendship between them had never altered him. Suddenly, there had come someone across his life who seemed to have disclosed to him life's mystery. And, yet, what was there to be afraid of? He was not a schoolboy or a girl. It was absurd to be frightened. Let us go and sit in the shade, said Lord Henry. Parker has brought out the drinks, and if you stay any longer in this glare, you will be quite spoiled, and Basil will never paint you again. You really must not allow yourself to become sunburnt. It would be unbecoming. What can it matter? cried Dorian Gray, laughing, as he sat down on the seat at the end of the garden. It should matter everything to you, Mr. Gray. Why? Because you have the most marvellous youth, and youth is the one thing worth having. I don't feel that, Lord Henry. No, you don't feel it now. Some day, when you are old and wrinkled and ugly, when thought has seared your forehead with its lines, and passion branded your lips with its hideous fires, you will feel it. You will feel it terribly. Now, wherever you go, you charm the world. Will it always be so? You have a wonderfully beautiful face, Mr. Grey. Don't frown. You have and beauty is a form of genius, is higher, indeed, than genius, as it needs no explanation. It is of the great facts of the world, like sunlight, or springtime, or the reflection in dark waters of that silver shell we call the moon. It cannot be questioned. It has its divine right of sovereignty. It makes princes of those who have it. You smile. Ah, oh, when you have lost it, you won't smile. People say sometimes, that beauty is only superficial. That may be so, but at least it is not so superficial as thought is. To me, beauty is the wonder of wonders. It is only shallow people who do not judge by appearances. The true mystery of the world is the visible, not the invisible. Yes, M.R. Gray, the gods have been good to you, but what the gods give they quickly take away. You have only a few years in which to live really, perfectly, and fully. When your youth goes, your beauty will go with it, and then you will suddenly discover that there are no triumphs left for you, or have to content yourself with those mean triumphs that the memory of your past will make more bitter than defeats. Every month, 
as it wanes brings you nearer to something dreadful. Time is jealous of you, and wars against your lilla and your roses. You will become sallow, and hollow-cheeked, and dull-eyed. You will suffer horribly. Ah, realize your youth while you have it. Don't squander the gold of your days, listening to the tedious, trying to improve the hopeless failure, or giving away your life to the ignorant, the common, and the vulgar. These are the sickly aims, the false ideals of our age. Live, live the wonderful life that is in you. Let nothing be lost upon you. Be always searching for new sensations. Be afraid of nothing. A new hedonism, that is what our century wants. You might be its visible symbol. With your personality, there is nothing you could not do. The world belongs to you for a season. The moment I met you I saw that you were quite unconscious of what you really are, of what you really might be. There was so much in you that charmed me that I felt I must tell you something about yourself. I thought how tragic it would be if you were wasted, for there is such a little time that your youth will last, such a little time. The common hill flowers wither, but they blossom again. The laburnum will be as yellow next June as it is now. In a month, there will be purple stars on the clematis, and year after year the green night of its leaves will hold its purple stars. But we never get back our youth. The pulse of joy that beats in us at twenty becomes sluggish. Our limbs fail. Our senses rot. We degenerate into hideous puppets, haunted by the memory of the passions of which we were too much afraid, and the exquisite temptations that we had not the courage to yield to. Youth! Youth! There is absolutely nothing in the world but youth. Dorian Gray listened, open-eyed and wondering. The spray of lilac fell from his hand upon the gravel. A furry bee came and buzzed round it for a moment. Then it began to scramble all over the oval stellated globe of the tiny blossoms. He watched it with that strange interest in trivial things that we try to develop when things of high import make us afraid, or when we are stirred by some new emotion for which we cannot find expression, or when some thought that terrifies us lays sudden siege to the brain and calls on us to yield. After a time the bee flew away. He saw it creeping into the stained trumpet of a Tyrian convolvulus. The flower seemed to quiver, and then swayed gently to and fro. Suddenly the painter appeared at the door of the studio, and made staccato signs for them to come in. They turned to each other and smiled. I am waiting, he cried. Do come in. The light is quite perfect, and you can bring your drinks. They rose up and sauntered down the wall together. Two green and white butterflies fluttered past them, and in the pear tree at the corner of the garden a thrush began to sing. You are glad you have met me, Mr. Grey, said Lord Henry, looking at him. Yes, I am glad now. I wonder shall I always be glad. Always. That is a dreadful word. It makes me shudder when I hear it. Women are so fond of using it. They spoil every romance by trying to make it last forever. It is a meaningless word, too. The only difference between a caprice and a lifelong passion is that the caprice lasts a little longer. As they entered the studio, Dorian Gray put his hand upon Lord Henry's arm. In that case, let our friendship be a caprice, he murmured, flushing at his own boldness, then stepped up on the platform and resumed his pose. Lord Henry flung himself into a large wicker armchair and watched him. The sweep and dash of the brush on the canvas made the only sound that broke the stillness, except when, now and then, Hallward stepped back to look at his work from a distance. In the slanting beams that streamed through the open doorway, the dust danced and was golden. The heavy scent of the roses seemed to brood over everything. After about a quarter of an hour, Hallward stopped painting, looked for a long time at Dorian Gray, and then for a long time at the picture, biting the end of one of his huge brushes and frowning. It is quite finished, he cried at last, and stooping down he wrote his name in long vermilion letters on the left-hand corner of the canvas. Lord Henry came over and examined the picture. It was certainly a wonderful work of art, and a wonderful likeness as well. My dear fellow, I congratulate you most warmly, he said. 
It is the finest portrait of modern times. Mr. Gray, come over and look at yourself. The lad started, as if awakened from some dream. Is it really finished? He murmured, stepping down from the platform. Quite finished, said the painter, and you have sat splendidly today. I am awfully obliged to you. That is entirely due to me, broke in Lord Henry. Isn't it, Mr. Gray? Dorian made no answer, but passed listlessly in front of his picture and turned towards it. When he saw it, he drew back, and his cheeks flushed for a moment with pleasure. A look of joy came into his eyes, as if he had recognised himself for the first time. He stood there motionless and in wonder, dimly conscious that Hallward was speaking to him, but not catching the meaning of his words. The sense of his own beauty came on him, a revelation. He had never felt it before. Basil Hallward's compliments had seemed to him to be merely the charming exaggeration of friendship. He had listened to them, laughed at them, forgotten them. They had not influenced his nature. Then had come Lord Henry Wotton with his strange panegyric on youth, his terrible warning of its brevity that had stirred him at the time. And now, as he stood gazing at the shadow of his own loveliness, the full reality of the description flashed across him. Yes, there would be a day when his face would be wrinkled and wizen, his eyes dim and colourless, the grace of his figure broken and deformed. The scarlet would pass away from his lips and the gold steel from his hair. The life that was to make his soul would mar his body. He would become dreadful, hideous and uncouth. As he thought of it, a sharp pang of pain struck through him like a knife and made each delicate fibre of his nature quiver. His eyes deepened into amethyst and across them came a mist of tears. He felt as if a hand of ice had been laid upon his heart. Don't you like it? cried Hallward at last, stung a little by the lad's silence, not understanding what it meant. Of course he likes it, said Lord Henry, who wouldn't like it. It is one of the greatest things in modern art. I will give you anything you like to ask for it. I must have it. It is not my property, Harry. Whose property is it? Dorian's, of course, answered the painter. He's a very lucky fellow. How sad it is, murmured Dorian Gray, with his eyes still fixed upon his own portrait. How sad it is. I shall grow old, and horrible, and dreadful. But this picture will remain always young. It will never be older than this particular day of June. If it were only the other way. If it were I who was to be always young, and the picture that was to grow old. For that, for that, I would give everything. Yes, there is nothing in the whole world I would not give. I would give my soul for that. You would hardly care for such an arrangement, Basil, cried Lord Henry, laughing. It would be rather hard lines on your work. I should object very strongly, Harry, said Hallward. Dorian Gray turned and looked at him. I believe you would, Basil. You like your art better than your friends. I am no more to you than a green bronze figure. Hardly as much, I dare say. The painter stared in amazement. It was so unlike Dorian to speak like that. What had happened? He seemed quite angry. His face was flushed and his cheeks burning. Yes, he continued. I am less to you than your ivory Hermes or your silver fawn. You will like them always. How long will you like me? Till I have my first wrinkle, I suppose. I know, now, that when one loses one's good looks, whatever they may be, one loses everything. Your picture has taught me that. Lord Henry Watton is perfectly right. Youth is the only thing worth having. When I find that I am growing old, I shall kill myself. Hallward turned pale and caught his hand. Dorian, Dorian, he cried, don't talk like that. I have never had such a friend as you, and I shall never have such another. You are not jealous of material things, are you? You are finer than any of them. I am jealous of everything whose beauty does not die. I am jealous of the portrait you have painted of me. Why should it keep what I must lose? Every moment that passes takes something from me and gives something to it. Oh, if it were only the other way. If the picture could change, and I could be always what I am now. Why did you paint it? 
It will mock me some day. Mock me horribly. The hot tears welled into his eyes he tore his hand away and, flinging himself on the divan, he buried his face in the cushions, as though he was praying. This is your doing, Harry, said the painter bitterly. Lord Henry shrugged his shoulders. It is the real Dorian Gray. That is all. It is not. If it is not, what have I to do with it? You should have gone away when I asked you, he muttered. I stayed when you asked me, was Lord Henry's answer. Harry, I can't quarrel with my two best friends at once, but between you both you have made me hate the finest piece of work I have ever done, and I will destroy it. What is it but canvas and colour? I will not let it come across our three lives and mar them. Dorian Gray lifted his golden head from the pillow, and with pallid face and tear-stained eyes, looked at him as he walked over to the deal painting table that was set beneath the high-curtained window. What was he doing there? His fingers were straying about among the litter of tin tubes and dry brushes, seeking for something. Yes, it was for the long palette knife, with its thin blade of lithe steel. He had found it at last. He was going to rip up the canvas. With a stifled sob, the lad leapt from the couch, and, rushing over to Holwood, tore the knife out of his hand, and flung it to the end of the studio. Don't, Basil, don't. He cried. It would be murder. I am glad you appreciate my work at last, Dorian, said the painter coldly, when he had recovered from his surprise. I never thought you would. Appreciate it. I am in love with it, Basil. It is part of myself. I feel that. Well, as soon as you are dry, you shall be varnished and framed and sent home. Then you can do what you like with yourself. And he walked across the room and rang the bell for tea. You will have tea, of course, Dorian. And so will you, Harry. Or do you object to such simple pleasures? I adore simple pleasures, said Lord Henry. They are the last refuge of the complex. But I don't like scenes, except on the stage. What absurd fellows you are, both of you. I wonder who it was defined man as a rational animal. It was the most premature definition ever given. Man is many things, but he is not rational. I am glad he is not, after all, though I wish you chaps would not squabble over the picture. You had much better let me have it, Basil. This silly boy doesn't really want it, and I really do. If you let anyone have it but me, Basil, I shall never forgive you, cried Dorian Gray, and I don't allow people to call me a silly boy. You know the picture is yours, Dorian. I gave it to you before it existed. And you know you have been a little silly, Mr. Gray. And that you don't really object to being reminded that you are extremely young. I should have objected very strongly this morning, Lord Henry. Ah, oh, this morning. You have lived since then. There came a knock at the door. And the butler entered with a laden tea tray and set it down upon a small Japanese table. There was a rattle of cups and saucers and the hissing of a fluted Georgian urn. Two globe-shaped china dishes were brought in by a page. Dorian Gray went over and poured out the tea. The two men sauntered languidly to the table and examined what was under the covers. Let us go to the theatre tonight, said Lord Henry. There is sure to be something on, somewhere. I have promised to dine at White's, but it is only with an old friend so I can send him a wire to say that I am ill, or that I am prevented from coming in consequence of a subsequent engagement. I think that would be a rather nice excuse. It would have all the surprise of candour. It is such a bore putting on one's dress clothes, muttered Hallward, and, when one has them on, they are so horrid. Yes, answered Lord Henry dreamily, the costume of the nineteenth century is detestable. It is so sombre, so depressing, Sin is the only real colour element left in modern life. You really must not say things like that before Dorian. Harry. Before which Dorian? The one who is pouring out tea for us. Or the one in the picture. Before either. I should like to come to the theatre with you, Lord Henry, said the lad. Then you shall come, and you will come, too, Basil, won't you? I can't, really. I would sooner not. I have a lot of work to do. Well... Then, you and I will go alone, Mr. Gray. I should like that awfully. The painter bit his lip and walked over, cup in hand, 
to the picture. I shall stay with the real Dorian, he said. Sodly, is it the real Dorian? cried the original of the portrait, strolling across to him. Am I really like that? Yes, you are just like that. How wonderful, Basil. At least you are like it in appearance. But it will never alter, sighed Hallward. That is something. What a fuss people make about fidelity, exclaimed Lord Henry. Why, even in love, it is purely a question for a physiology. It has nothing to do with our own will. Young men want to be faithful, and are not old men want to be faithless, and cannot. That is all one can say. Don't go to the theatre tonight, Dorian, said Hallward. Stop and dine with me. I can't, Basil. Why? Because I have promised Lord Henry Watton to go with him. He won't like you the better for keeping your promises. He always breaks his own. I beg you not to go. Dorian Gray laughed and shook his head. I entreat you. The lad hesitated and looked over at Lord Henry, who was watching them from the tea table with an amused smile. I must go, Basil, he answered. Very well, said Hallward, and he went over and laid down his cup on the tray. It is rather late, and, as you have to dress, you had better lose no time. Goodbye, Harry. Goodbye, Dorian. Come and see me soon. Come tomorrow. Certainly. You won't forget. No, of course not, cried Dorian. And, Harry. Yes, Basil. Remember what I asked you. When we were in the garden this morning, I have forgotten it. I trust you. I wish I could trust myself, said Lord Henry, laughing. Come, Amar. Grey, my hansom is outside, and I can drop you at your own place. Goodbye, Basil. It has been a most interesting afternoon. As the door closed behind them, the painter flung himself down on a sofa, and the look of pain came into his face.